I'd like to begin the presentation by acknowledging the traditional owners of all the different lands on which we are gathered today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and all Aboriginal Australians across the country. So thank you all for taking the time to join us today. I'm going to begin the session just with a brief introduction to VEFMAP to provide context for some of the listeners who possibly aren't um, familiar with the program. So through the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, the Victorian Government invests in two statewide monitoring programs to assess the impacts of water for the environment. There is the Victorian Environmental Flows Monitoring Assessment Program, or VEFMAP, which monitors rivers across the state, and WETMAP, our Wetland Monitoring and Assessment Program for environmental watering. Both VEFMAP and WETMAP use a mixed approach to investigating ecological responses to environmental flows, including long-term and targeted intervention monitoring, modelling, soil moisture studies, and a range of other approaches, all of which Chris and Zeb will discuss uh, today in their presentations. VEFMAP is a relatively long-term monitoring program that's been delivered in stages, with stage six covering the last four years of monitoring and research from 2016 to 2020, which is the focus of today's talks. Monitoring began in 2007 following the introduction of the environmental watering entitlements through the Victorian Water Act. And the program was reviewed in 2014. And one of the key recommendations to come from these reviews was that stage six monitoring should focus on fish and vegetation outcomes. There were a range of other recommendations as well, but that was a key one. There were two main objectives for stage six. One was to clearly demonstrate outcomes from environmental flows to stakeholders and the community. And the other was to fill key knowledge gaps to inform and improve adaptive management. ARI led the monitoring research and our approach to the program focused on strong collaborations with CMA environmental water managers who guided site selection and were closely involved in planning and in the discussion of results as soon as they were available. This way they could use the results as soon as possible to inform adaptive management. There have been many benefits associated with this partnership and it's something that we're very keen to continue and extremely thankful for. Communications and engagement have also been a key focus for Stage 6 and Pam Clooney, our comms and engagement lead from ARI, will present results from an Anglo Citizen Science project at the end of Zeb's talk today, as well as presenting further details on the comms and engagement approach as part of the overview talk next Friday, the 11th of December. Ooh, sorry. The results and outcomes from stage six have recently been published. These take the form of a high level brochure, a substantive synthesis report that summarizes the results, comments on management implications and provides management recommendations. Plus, there are also a large number of associated scientific publications and unpublished client reports. If you're interested in downloading these publications, they can all be found on the ARI website in the section devoted to VEFMAP. You'll also find uh, our contact details here. So if you have any questions or um, want to follow up on anything after the presentations, please have a look at the website for our contact details and feel free to get in touch. It's probably also worth mentioning here that um, the, the main audience for these publications is water managers and scientists and communication products for interested community members will be released next year in collaboration with Victorian CMAs in The View, although there have been a number of community focused publications throughout the last four years, so we've already made a start on this. As you are aware, today's presentations are theme based with Chris Jones presenting outcomes from the vegetation theme now and Zeb Tonkin presenting the fish theme results from 11.30 to 12.30 later this morning. The presentations are being recorded and I'm sure you'll have noticed that you're all on mute. At the end of the presentations, we'll open up everyone's microphones for questions. So on that 
note, I will stop sharing my screen and hand over to Chris. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, it's really nice to know that it's not just myself and Jack here, um, which is a good start. Um, in, a, in addition as well to Jack's um, acknowledgement of country for um, who is watching today, um, I'd also like to make an acknowledgement to uh, of country for all of the places where we have conducted our fieldwork um, and travelled through, which uh, being a statewide program is a lot. Um, so here's the talk and I will um, hopefully be able to make this entertaining for you. Uh, I want to start with just describing the flow regime. This flow, this talk is all about environmental flows um, and we have to understand that well before we move forwards. So firstly, the river flow is largely based around rainfall. Um, here's a very basic understanding of rainfall in temperate climates of Victoria, high in winter and low in, in summer. The natural flow regime matches this uh, rainfall pattern and so does the temperature with cooler temperatures in winter and higher temperatures when the rivers are shallower uh, in summer. Regulated flow regimes are often, uh, often quite uh, altered from the natural flow regimes. Um, and there's a few key parts of the regulated flow regime that we are talking today, talking about today. And I want to highlight just a few of those. Now, this is this diagram here shows a very um, simplified version of a regulated flow regime. Uh, it's different for every waterway. It's different between years. But uh, this general idea will hopefully give you an, a sense of the, the key components. So firstly, we have winter spring base flows or low flows. Uh, which are low discharges uh, of water, uh, essentially just keeping the, the lower part of the river going. We also have winter and spring freshers, which are commonly, commonly delivered to try to mimic the high natural flow regime uh, peaks. We also have or spring and summer consumptive flows, usually for irrigation or other consumptive purposes. We have summer and autumn freshers, which are usually much smaller than winter and spring freshers. And summer and autumn base flows or low flows. And so the, the specific location of these and the number of these events, it will vary a lot. Um, but using this information and, and roughly uh, which of these is able to be delivered in each waterway, we're able to build our conceptual model of how we think uh, ecosystems respond to these individual events. And here's a conceptual model that we have uh, produced for vegetation. So there's the, the same flow components of base flows, high flows and freshers at different times of the year. They do different things, all contributing towards uh, population processes. And those key processes of longevity, so survival of plants, uh, recruitment of new plants and dispersal of propagules throughout the system. And if we get all of that, the balance of that right, then we can um, try to steer out towards our fundamental outcome of having um, healthy waterways for vegetation. So I won't go into the detail of this, this basic overall model, um, but having a broad sense of this framework is helpful for going forwards. Another thing that's helpful is describing the veget the, what riparian vegetation is. And there are a lot of different definitions for what it is. Uh, and essentially the main uh, separation in the categories is between terrestrial vegetation, anything that's uh, not associated with a waterway, and riparian vegetation, any plants that are associated with the waterway. And within that riparian group, there is uh, various categories and there's lots of different ways to define those different groups of plants. In this case, we've gone with a, a relatively simple approach of aquatic, semi-aquatic, emergent and fringing. And all of these groups overlap in their distributions um, in relation to inundation depth and frequency. And that dynamic um, of the riparian vegetation, the those groups and with the terrestrial vegetation is um, a really key process for um, vegetation on waterways and what I'll be talking about today. 
So given all of that so far, for stage six, the last four years of this uh, research program, we had five key evaluation questions, KQs, uh, for vegetation. The first three of these were concerned with different groups of vegetation. First, uh, KQ1 about aquatic vegetation, two emergent and three uh, for fringing vegetation. And essentially, we were trying to understand how environmental flow discharge influences the spatial distribution, foliage cover and diversity of those different groups um, within a, a sub a small reach of a, a waterway. For KQ4, we were looking at uh, recruitment of all of these different plant groups. And for five, we were looking at some of the other factors that influence uh, plants responses um, to flows um, and the relative abundance of plants and their distribution. So things like grazing, rainfall, soil properties, this time, the season, the time of year. And so this guided our research uh, for the four years, uh, this set of questions. In terms of data collection, to answer these questions, we had a, a diverse approach. The first uh, component and the primary component of this program was an intervention monitoring um, process. So this was transect based surveys uh, and quadrats on riverbanks across the state um, before and after individual flow events. So spring freshes or summer freshes or um, summer base flows. And so essentially these, the timing of these surveys was uh, conducted in spring, summer and autumn. And this was really critical because previous to stage six, the surveys were done every few years. And so there was no ability to be able to untangle the effects of an individual event. There might be a change between this year and another year, um, but there's all sorts of events that happen in that time and attribution of um, any effect to any individual flow component was, is impossible uh, without this intervention approach. In addition to that, we also did some broad scale mapping um, over a larger spatial scale that wasn't tied to strict transit locations. This was a snapshot survey, so it wasn't repeated through time. It was just done once for each of our sites. Uh, in addition to those, we had some in situ experiments, uh, livestock grazing exclosures and carp exclosures, uh, carp and waterfowl. We also had some ex situ experiments uh, with Joe Greet and the team at uh, WERG at Melbourne Uni, as you can see here, and as well as soil moisture and river flow logging. So it was really a diverse set of data collection methods, and it was this set of different data collection streams that really um, made a huge difference to the, our ability to be able to understand what's going on. Um, and provide good management outcomes from this pro from this project. So where did we do it? Um, given that it's a statewide program, we wanted to travel as far across the state as we could. But having said that, it's very time consuming to do detailed surveys in a lot of places, and so we couldn't get to everywhere. So there was a balance between spread and data density in any one location. So we picked these seven systems. The Campaspe, Loddon, Wimmera, Glenelg, Mirabal, Yarra, Thompson, McAllister. And there's 44 sites across those uh, areas. Uh, we also had um, soil moisture uh, probes on the Goulburn. You can see a dot out there by itself. Um, that was additional, uh, no vegetation surveys, but we had soil moisture probes there. Uh, we didn't survey each of these sites the same number of times. Every one of them had at least three surveys, a spring, summer, autumn um, set. But in the Wimmera system, we did that for uh, two years. And in the Campaspe system, we did that in four years. Uh, the others were just a single year. And this was done because we uh, didn't have the resources to do it all four years at all of those places. And But we wanted to see how important it was if you surveyed multiple years to capture variation between years. And so we wanted to have some sites where we did survey continuously through multiple years. And that will really help to guide the um, future studies and the how frequently we need to survey. Importantly, this also covers a large 
um, rainfall gradient across the state um, and a lot of flow types, river flow types. So I'll present the outcomes today on these uh, different groups. Um, aquatic vegetation around KQ1, I've grouped um, emergent fringing and terrestrial vegetation together, um, KQ2 and 3, uh, because they all uh, overlap and respond to the same processes. Uh, then recruitment, KQ4, and soil moisture, soil moisture and livestock grazing, KQ5. And then finally, I'll just prevent, present a little bit about the communication, um, which has been a really important part of stage six. So firstly, aquatic vegetation. This is the vegetation that's in the stream, often submerged or floating. Um, and there's two primary objectives that um, waterway managers have in, in Victoria for uh, aquatic vegetation. These are to provide water resources and maintain aquatic habitat um, and maintain water quality. And that's usually achieved through summer um, freshes um, to uh, maintain water quality when the water level low, uh, drops down, as well as the base flows and low flows. So essentially just keeping water in the system to keep those plants alive. Um, so very broadly, um, our findings in this study have supported these two these objectives. Um, certainly, uh, environmental water does maintain water quality through reducing turbidity, reducing salinity, um, uh, increasing dissolved oxygen, oxygen. But that hasn't been the focus of our work. Uh, we've been focused on the vegetation responses, and we have seen that providing water does keep plants alive. But there's a lot more to it than that. And we found a lot of places where there's um, limitations to the responses um, and some of the mechanisms for why places will have different amounts of vegetation. So I'll go into some detail about that now. So firstly, here is the spread of flow regimes um, in our surveys for all but one or two sites. Um, so this graph shows the total annual discharge in megalitres um, in a year across the sites. And so you can see there's a big range. Um, a lot of sites on the left that have very little um, annual flow and uh, sites on the right that have an, a very large flow. Um, and over the, this period of 2011, since the um, end of the millennium drought uh, to 2018. And so there's a, there's, we have really um, widespread of sites. And so this example here of the on the far left of the Mackenzie River in the uh, Wimmera CMA, which goes dry in summer, um, ceases to flow and the, and the river bank um, goes dry in many cases. And up the other end, we have the Yarra River with very high flow volumes. Um, and so there's very different uh, expectations for what we would see for aquatic vegetation uh, in these cases, but also very different expectations of what can be achieved with environmental flows in these places. Clearly in places like the Yarra River, there's no lack of water um, for these um, aquatic plants. And there are other issues that are um, uh, relevant to those than places like the Mackenzie River, where actual provision of water is, is critical to plant survival. What we see is that in most cases, the high, highest abundance of aquatic vegetation is in the lower flow areas. So this is the Murable River in the Krangamite CMA that has some of the highest uh, aquatic vegetation abundance um, of all the rivers we surveyed, which was right down the, the left hand side of the um, of the flow regime in the previous figure. Um, and so what we did is that we mapped out the aquatic vegetation as well as other um, emergent and fringing species across the sites and tried to, uh, we did this for all of our sites and summed all the aquatic vegetation together, um, the, the extent, and looked at how that compared against our different flow categories of one is low to five is very high. And we saw essentially as you increase the amount of flow, the aquatic vegetation um, extent declines in general. 
but there's quite a bit of variation around that. So generally speaking, less water is good um, because the, of uh, flow velocity and flow volume um, and depth, things that negatively affect vegetation, uh, aquatic species. However, um, we can't go to the point of having um, no water. Um, that's, of it's, that's also bad. So less water is good, but you can't have too little. And the Mackenzie River example here again is uh, there's a really big difference between um, keeping the soil moist throughout the summer period and not. Essentially, that's a make or break for survival of uh, aquatic plants. And so if we look at the amount of no flow or the cease to flow when the river is, is applying, again, from low to high, we can see that if you have um, a constantly flowing river in category one, then generally speaking, there's lower lower cut, lower cut amount of aquatic vegetation. There's a real sweet spot if you have a little bit of that, it's flowing but not raging all the time. But once you get to category three, there's it's really polarized. You can have um, situations where the, the river runs dry and everything dies and then you have your dots down the bottom of that box plot and you also have situations where the river has stopped flowing but it's all pulled behind a weir and so essentially it turns into a little lake and the vegetation goes crazy and so it does really well so there's a lot of different so it's tricky to use any individual flow component like flow uh, discharge or the number of no flow days or any individual flow component to go to um, understand what is going on in each waterway. So we decided to dig further in, into all the different things that were affecting aquatic vegetation. On the Campaspe River, uh, like many others, we see a pattern of declining ve aquatic vegetation as you go downstream. So there's three reaches here, reach two, three and four, um, going downstream below Lake Epilock on the Campaspe River and a de declining um, extent of aquatic vegetation. Now this um, directly matches the um, reverse pattern of turbidity, which increases as you go downstream. What that looks like in the river is, uh, so upstream this is a site in reach uh, two, um, that English's bridge, and a site in reach four, uh, four as well. As the, this is at the same time of year and there's a clear difference in the turbidity levels in these um, sites, um, which is, is not the only factor, but it is, a, is an important factor in dictating how much aquatic vegetation there may or may not be. So there are many additional factors as well, which some that we have uh, quite good data on and some that we are still trying to piece the um, bits of the puzzle together. In the upper left picture here, we have the Yarra River um, at Millgrove, which is a, it's a tall canopy um, and it's very uh, high shade. And we see very little vegetation in uh, dense canopy uh, waterways. The same thing occurs when you have a high density of willows. Um, and if the willows are removed, then the aquatic vegetation usually goes crazy. We also have in the lower left, um, sorry, that says the Mackenzie River, but it's the Campaspe River, um, uh, the carp and waterfowl exposures. And there's a clear effect of um, both of those animals on the recruitment and abundance of aquatic vegetation. So we put together a bit of a list of um, different things um, that are required for abundant aquatic vegetation. So you've got to have wet soil, um, low flow volume, but it can't be too dry. Um, turbidity needs to be low, low shade, not too deep. Um, low disturbance, there needs to be a proper gill source, um, high water quality, um, things like salinity, and a suitable substrate without too much sedimentation. So there are other things as well, but see, these are some of the key ones. And of these, not all of them are uh, can be modified by environmental flows. Um, some of them can, um, but some of them can't. And so it's really critical to understand where are the places where we expect we can do some, make a change, a beneficial change through flow management or a flow delivery, and where is something else really important. 
um, for example, the willows where you can't um, get aquatic vegetation outcomes until a dense canopy of willows is removed. So overall, the broad implications for management for aquatic vegetation are that uh, environmental flows are critically important um, for aquatic veg, in, but mostly in dry systems uh, where the water can maintain, um, where, sorry, where flows can actually maintain water availability and keep plants alive. Um, this is really critical, particularly in dry or intermittent streams. Um, however, there are a lot of situations where we expect that um, there are limited outcomes despite being able to deliver or alter flows. And so being able to refine our understanding of where we do expect change and where we don't and what other actions need to be taken can really help guide um, sensible or, or refined manage management objectives that go beyond um, where the understanding is um, to give better expectations about what we expect to do and also um, use multiple management actions um, to get a, a better outcome. So this work um, is summarised in the report, but also these two papers that are currently in prep, in prep um, and soon to be released. And so you can keep your eyes peeled for those um, that will that takes more detail in what I've just described. So moving onwards or up the bank in a way um, to fringing emergent and terrestrial vegetation. Uh, it's a real arm wrestle between these species on the on the bank. And there are a lot of a lot of objectives for waterway managers on these rivers. Um, and all flow components um, from our uh, freshers and base flows, as well as consumptive flows, impact these these areas. Um, the objectives are usually pretty uh, straightforward in terms of being able to maintain uh, populations of these plants. And so we have tried to understand how these flow components do that, but also understand how the mechanisms are occurring and try to refine the management. And our data have supported a lot of these processes and we have found a lot of, um, we have dramatically improved our understanding of what we of how we know that vegetation responds to being inundated, um, what it requires and how you might refine management to get to maximise outcomes. But again, there are many places where we expect to have minimal outcomes, um, particularly for native species. I'll summarise that in a bit more detail here. So here's a good example on the Thompson River within the West Gippsland CMA. Um, on the bank and it's a real fight between the emergent species in the, the lower um, parts of the bank um, on the water margin, uh, fringing species above that, riparian species and then uh, terrestrial species up the bank. And depending on where the flows get to and how long they are there, um, guides, the arm, guides the arm wrestle between these and the competition between these plants and what ends up being the the, the ultimate composition of, of plants on the bank. Here's another example on the Campaspe River um, where there's a really distinct line um, at this particular location where the spring fresh level gets to. Um, Darren White from the CMA has taken photos um, during the middle of the spring fresh, which is delivered has been delivered for about five or six years now to approximately this or almost exactly the same elevation. And there's a really distinct um, transition above and below the line with riparian species dominating below and terrestrial species um, and floodplain uh, species dominating above. So looking at some of the data that uh, reflects some of this, um, we have these figures here um, that have the percentage cover of four different species with elevation up the bank on the x-axis. So looking at the left figure first, we have Phragmites australis, which is the, the common uh, reed, which uh, many people will be familiar with. And the vertical lines of blue and, and red are the elevations um, related to the base flow level and the spring fresh level at this particular site. And we can see that Phragmites um, cover can be high anywhere essentially between those two levels. 
um, some in some cases below the base flow level, but it's most abundant between the base flow level and the spring fresh level. Whereas um, Alternatura denticulata is a, a mudflat uh, fringing specialist, um, and it's uh, more abundant closer to the uh, base flow level, where it's wetter almost perennially. Then we have the, the common tussock grass, um, Poa Lab, uh, which sits higher on the bank, um, up, up to and slightly over the, um, the spring fresh point. And then a terrestrial species, Oxalis, it's very intolerant of being inundated, um, tends to rot the, bowl, rot the bowls, as uh, Alana Main, our student, has uh, really clearly documented. And so you can see the clear distributions of, of different species and their preferences to um, or their tolerances of inundation um, in their positions on the bank. So regimes really, um, flow regimes can uh, strongly dictate the composition of vegetation on the bank. Here's an example of not a regime, but a single flow event um, again, on the Campaspe River, it was in 2016, uh, just when the program started and we came after the large natural flow event. Um, and there was a lot of plants that were killed below that, um, below the flow line, excuse me, um, because it was such a large event. And so while we have regimes that slowly steer towards um, certain compositions, we also have single events that can cross survival thresholds or tolerance thresholds of plants and have dramatic changes in, um, in a rapid period of time. So this led us to want to do some experimentation to find out what some of these thresholds were. So we went to the, um, to the Burnley campus of the University of Melbourne with uh, Joe Greet um, and set up some experiments. Um, we grew some plants in the nursery, put some plants in tanks um, and had various treatments uh, for inundation um, in the tanks, uh, which included shade treatments, different uh, inundation durations, and also different temperatures. Now this work was done um, in conjunction with uh, Joe and Lindsay Vivian uh, from ARI, as well as three excellent students, which were very, very fortunate to have. Uh, Vanya Katanovic, Marjorie Pereira, who did a, a seed bank experiment, and Alana Main. Um, and all of that work is completed now. Um, and it really was very, it was fun and very beneficial to the project. Um, and I'll just briefly describe some of the results for that here. So the first experiment was um, conducted in winter and uh, spring. And we looked at plants inundated in the tanks to see how they um, responded to being underwater. And essentially what we found was, here's an example of for wallaby grass um, and looked at the height through time at different inundations and the, um, the pur pinky, purple and blue are the longer durations of inundation. And essentially the longer the duration, inundation duration, the, the less growth there was. Um, Surprisingly, though, there were very few plants that died. There were only three plants in the whole experiment of about 324 plants um, that died in the whole experiment. So all of the plants were very tolerant of inundation. Um, however, in terms of that was from survival point of view of survival, but growth was impacted. And across the six different species that we looked at, um, the same pattern held essentially. Um, and each species was negatively affected by longer periods of inundation. Now, this was also the case, this was equally the case for um, terrestrial, more terrestrial plants, as well as um, aquatic plants, although the terrestrial ones tended to be more sensitive than plants that were considered aquatic. So this was really quite surprising that the plants would be so tolerant they could be underwater for up to a month, um, or over a month, sorry, and still be alive in many cases. Or, albeit um, a bit sadder. So for our summer experiment, we um, essentially did the same uh, thing. This project was led by um, Lindsay Vivian from ARI, and we had um, inundation of plants uh, for a series of uh, different treatments 
Uh, in this case, we had so that on the top is for no week, so no inundation. Uh, the next one down is for two week pulses. You can see the gray shading, uh, two weeks on, two weeks off. Um, and then four weeks and then eight weeks of continuous inundation. And what we found is for the same species that we had in the previous one, uh, where only three plants died over the experiment, um, all the plants had died essentially um, within two weeks in summer inundation. And so there was a dramatic difference in the um, survival um, and, and the tolerance of being inundated um, with the from cool season to warm season. As we looked across the other the species compared, um, there was only one species, the common tussock grass again on the far right, that uh, survived the entire duration. Um, all other species um, had some or all total mortality um, over the, the period. So there was a really strong difference. And that was a really, this again was a surprise about how different um, the responses could be uh, in the same year, but just uh, when hotter or cooler temperatures. So a third experiment, which was led by Alana Main, um, that is completed now, but is um, currently in review, uh, took this another step forward. And we did the following year in spring um, inundation with artificially elevated water temperatures. And artificially elevated temperatures that took temperatures to around summer conditions, uh, summer temperatures, uh, were able to, re to semi-replicate the, um, the summer mortality. And so we're starting to untangle some of the mechanisms for how this might work, uh, water temperature um, being a driver um, and increasing plant, um, we, we think a, a major part of it is increasing plant um, metabolism and but without being able to respire, plants are, suffer uh, quite quickly in that period. But I'll go into this in more, this is in, described in more detail in the reports. I'm also talking about these experiments in more detail in uh, the, at the a AFSS conference next week for anyone who is going along to that. So these inundation patterns um, and their impact on plants shape the composition of vegetation. But that shaping of composition has to be in the context of the shape of the channel. Uh, here's two examples from they're within a, a kilometre of each other on two different channels. Uh, the one on the top left is on the Loddon River, uh, where there is a relatively steep bank for the inter for the size of this river. And there's a correspondingly very distinct and marked uh, composition shift as you go from uh, sedges on the very margin, rushes above that, and terrestrial species above that. Um, however, oops, sorry, in comparison, um, in the lower right, there's uh, the 12 mile creek, which is a flatter profile, and water goes uh, the inundation when it when the spring fresh goes up inundates a wider part of the bank and the riparian zone is dramatically widened with opportunities for different species to occur. And so there are a lot of factors that come into play. Um, soil type, the channel form, the inundation regime, uh, the species uh, composition and proper yield availability, all factors that guide what we expect to see. Another thing with the timing is the is the summer inundation. And so um, while many flow events are beneficial to, to the riparian uh, vegetation because they disadvantage terrestrial species in preference to riparian species, summer inundation really um, hits these uh, riparian plants hard. Um, and this is uh, before and after summer inundation on the Campaspe River, where there was a consumptive flow um, that inundated these areas, and there was a dramatic loss loss in the cover of the plants through what would normally be their peak growing and recruitment period. And you can see the reduction in the in the cover. And so there's a real um, opportunity here to understand the um, the strong negative effects um, of inundation and to try to refine the flow um, regime approach so that the 
uh, we're able to maximize the the benefits of, of flow regimes and to guide um, the vegetation composition to uh, where we need it, where we want it to be. One of the catches is relating to um, exotic species. So here's an example on the Watts River, um, a tributary of the Yarra River. And these are almost all um, exotic species, but they are all um, inundation tolerant plants. Um, so we have blackberry, vinca, kaikuyu, um, all of the, the favourites. And no amount of delivering flows is going to control these plants. Um, flows are able to control terrestrial plants, but not um, riparian or, or inundation tolerant ones. And so if native, vegeta native riparian vegetation is a really key objective, um, flows can't steer places like this towards that regime. The only way to remove this is um, using other, other management approaches, um, such as weed removal approaches, spraying or physical removal. And here's some data that reflects some of the, the patterns. Um, so Wimmera sites, which are drier, um, are grouped together, and Gippsland sites. And there's a plots of exotic cover versus native cover um, in, a, in some of these different uh, vegetation groups. And essentially we see that uh, the terrestrial for both groups is largely dominated by exotic uh, plants. Um, but we often see that either exotic cover or native cover uh, dominates rather than both dominating together. And so where we have ex high exotic cover, um, we expect very little benefit from our, from our environmental flows uh, from a native vegetation point of view. And this is really important because um, it, where, our, where native vegetation objectives are uh, a highlight or a, a really high objective for a particular waterway, um, we need multiple management actions to achieve the outcomes. So the, the implications for, for this is that the, for environmental flows, that the depth and the duration and the timing um, does determine species composition. And by knowing how this works, uh, the tolerances of vegetation, and what the objectives are, we can use environmental flows to carefully steer vegetation composition towards um, a desired state. Um, however, this is riparian native or exotic um, and flows can't be used to uh, control exotic riparian plants. Um, also that summer inundation has really strong impacts on vegetation, um, riparian and terrestrial. And so while there might be opportunities there to um, benefit plants, um, a bit vegetation composition, uh, it needs to be considered carefully uh, because lots of damage can be done. So this work uh, is summarized in three separate publications, um, one published, one in review, and one in prep for the inundation experiments as well as uh, another paper that's in prep for which summarizes their field work component. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for those as they come out. So moving on to, um, sorry, this is a recruitment one. The heading is incorrect there. Um, we have uh, objectives for triggering re recruitment through flows. And we have found that the, uh, that freshers um, and spring freshers have, uh, do have an important role, but there are a lot of important knowledge gaps to re plant recruitment. Importantly, recruitment is a, has multiple components. Um, the plants, the, is, we're talking about uh, recruitment from seed in many cases. Um, the majority of riparian plants uh, do reproduce by seed, but there are many that have other, other forms of reproduction. Um, producing from stolons and rhizomes and these sorts of things. But from seed, there's a germination component um, that requires certain conditions, and then establishment to maturity also requires other conditions. And here we're focusing on the germination component. 
And so we've looked at seedlings at in our uh, surveys um, across all of our sites and looked at when they occur um, throughout our surveys. Um, and generally the highest abundance is through the cooler seasons. Um, but it varies a lot with sites and we also have most of our data from in spring as well. So there's a, um, a bit of a bias there. We also look across for patterns uh, within individual individual species to see where um, plants are tending to show up more often in the seed bank uh, from in their recruitment. And we also look at where they occur on the bank. So the number of seedlings on the y-axis and the elevation up the bank for one particular site here in relation to the, the blue, the base flow and the red spring uh, fresh level. And you see that more um, emergent or fringing species tend to uh, germinate lower on the bank, um, terrestrial species higher on the bank. But there's a widespread um, across these elevations. All of that information um, is being the final analysis that uh, under underway right now. And so I'm going to summarize it here in a, in a bit of a diagram. Again, in relation to rainfall, as showed earlier, we have our natural flow regime and our regulated flow regime. And essentially, we see most of the most of the germination occurring um, from a rainfall triggered um, uh, rainfall triggers when the autumn rains came, the autumn break. And this can be any time, as most people will tell you, it can vary significantly between years. Um, but when it happens, it wets the soil and things start to germinate. Um, it can progress right through, uh, through winter until quite late, um, depending on how wet that wet season is. Um, and then after that period, we see a second um, period of germination that's triggered from the high um, high flow levels, uh, river levels. Um, they have triggered a so as the as the flow comes down, um, we see exposure as the as the soil gets exposed to the air, um, a wave of recruitment that occurs. So in some cases, these the rain triggered germination event and the high flow triggered event are one in the same. Um, it gets really wet, it stays wet for a long time, and as the water goes down, then everything comes up. However, in some cases, we have autumn rains and then a relatively dry winter and things start germinating. Then there might be a spring fresh um, that inundates the soil again. The seedlings that already came up survive that fresh in most cases. And then there's a second wave of recruitment. And so in some cases, a, a fresh event is able to trigger new flow, uh, new recruitment, and in some cases, it just supports the uh, is just a component of the um, a more natural process. The final one is about low flow trigger germination, where we think it's important for um, river flows to go down naturally to promoting uh, recruitment for emergent and aquatic species in the channel bed. And we're working on that um, over the coming years. So germination patterns are dictated by flow and, and rainfall. Rainflow is a, is a major one. Um, and in, it depends on the year about how um, environmental flows can provide that benefit. Um, so it can trigger uh, germination in some years um, and also potentially um, encourage survival of the recruits that have um, that have recruited over the summer. But we are looking into that in the coming years. These are summarized, summarized into publications as well um, to look out for. And now I'm just going to briefly discuss some of the other mechanisms. So soil moisture and livestock grazing. Um, we put in soil moisture probes that go down into the soil profile at different bank elevations. Um, to look at soil moisture through um, through the soil profile in relation to flow events. And here's Greg Fletcher and the Wimmera um, installing them on the bank here on the Mackenzie River. We did this at um, these sites. There's um, three pairs in the Wimmera, three in the Campaspe and two in the Goulburn. And here's an example of the output. Um, so the saturation level, so wet is up um, through time. And you can see that the dip the the different depths 
um, the darker is deeper, um, have different saturation levels. And you can see at these two the sites on the Campaspe River, essentially the flow is that the soil is saturated um, once you get to the deeper profiles. And that's um, doesn't change regardless of whether there's freshers or any flow components because the river is perennial. Those deeper layers are more or less saturated at every um, uh, throughout the year. However, in um, the Burnt Creek in the Wimmera system, which is an intermittent stream, um, the deeper layers do dry out over the uh, late summer period and they re-wet again when the river runs again. And so in most cases, we think that um, for a perennial river, uh, most regulated rivers, there's relatively little um, benefit for a, a spring fresh, for example, um, for deeper rooted plants, but they might, have, might be significant um, for shallow rooted plants, um, especially or young plants. Um, so this work is being compiled into a, uh, a paper that uh, is being undertaken now. We're still collecting some very last bits of data to finalize the analysis on that one, but um, it's been a really interesting and informative um, study. So finally with grazing, um, essentially it has a really big impact. We've got uh, sheep grazing, um, in the Tullaroot Creek on the top left, um, cattle grazing on the Campaspe River on the top right, a sheep grazing exclosure on the bottom left, and a cattle grazing exclosure on the Yarra on the bottom right. And it's not a surprise to people that livestock grazing is bad for riparian vegetation, um, but we also wanted to understand how quickly it could recover if it was removed. So here's a plot for a grazing exclosure. Um, plant cover um, on the y-axis and elevation up the bank on the x. Um, and each of these uh, boxes is a different survey. And we can see that native vegetation increases inside the exclosure um, over the first year. Um, exotic vegetation didn't increase as much at all. And we see these sort of yearly cycles of, of increases with native vegetation doing particularly well in this uh, particular site. In contrast, at a different site, um, we saw that native vegetation had very minimal re uh, response, um, but exotic vegetation in increased in cover quite dramatically um, over that same period. However, in relation to flows, the native vegetation increased substantially, most substantially, where the spring freshes uh, were delivered, whereas the exotic vegetation increased substantially above the spring fresh level, so where the flows didn't get to. And so there's a really strong interaction between the grazing effect and the flow regime on the ultimate, um, the final species composition. So the summary is that moderate to heavy grazing is really disastrous for riparian vegetation, but grazing removal and e-flows can relatively rapidly restore the the riparian cover, but it will do this for native and exotic species. This is summarised in the report for the exclusion specifically and our paper soon to be out. All of this information feeds back into our conceptual model over these last four years, um, where we continue to refine it and update it. And we also try to feed all of this information to the various sources that we need to. So the communication for VEFMAP has been a really um, critical part of the program and there's been a really concer concerted effort to make sure that all of the information is well shared uh, timely uh, with various sources. And there's lots of different ways that we have done that. Um, Pam will go into detail about that um, later in the talk next week. Finally, um, for the next steps, we are currently revising the program KQs and approaches we also have um, new collaborations with different researchers and increased traditional owner involvement. So this is really important for the program to have these uh, changes and reviews. And so we're really excited about what comes, uh, comes next. Uh, so that's it. Thank you for coming along and watching. Um, if you want to know more information, as Jack said earlier, uh, you can go to the ARI website to learn more. Um, also, you can um, go to the talk on Friday where uh, Jackie and Pam will explain some of the program overall and 
um, more of the communication. But feel free to get in touch if you would like to know anything or if you would like to be part of future collaborations. Okay, well, thank you so much, Chris. That was a great summary of what is clearly a, a huge amount of work. Because it's such a huge amount of work, you have taken us right to 11 o'clock, which means we have um, probably run out of time for questions, but perhaps we could just take um, one or two if if we've got people who would like to ask a question. I think Di Crowther has her hand up or maybe not. Yes. Yes, I have. Thanks, Jack. And thanks, Chris. That was really informative. Um, I'm curious to know um, the, the trials that you did on the um, the fringing emergent and terrestrial plants. Um, obviously, they were done in um, in fresh, clear water. I'm just wondering how much of an impact do you think those flows in a natural setting um, are carrying that sediment and the impact that they're having on the health and survival of those species? Yeah, thanks, Di. That's a um, really good point. Um, turbidity is a really important factor. We th oh, we we thought that that might be the case um, for inundating plants um, and their responses to an being to an inundation event. Um, we ha it's very difficult to replicate turbidity um, in a tank setting um, that would appropriately mimic um, natural water um, conditions, but um, we tried to do this by adding shade cloth over the top of the tank, so at least we could replicate part of that um, effect of turbidity um, in the reduction of light. And in most cases, it, it didn't have a strong effect, um, but in summer, it did um, it did have some benefit in uh, benefit to plants rather than a, um, a negative effect on the on the plant. So we do have some information on that and. You can see that more in the in the report if you want to go into it, or let me know, and I'll happy to chat. Thanks, Chris. Do we have anyone else who has a question that they'd like to ask now? If not, that is absolutely fine. As both Chris and I said, please do feel free to get in touch and to follow up on any questions. Kate's got a question. <laughs> Please fire away. Hi, Chris and everyone. Uh, great talk. Really loved it. Um, you pretty much put all of my questions around environmental monitoring. Please excuse the doorbell in the background. It's too noisy. Uh, how did your carp exclusion go? I, I didn't hear that mentioned. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's going really good, actually, and it's quite good timing because I was out doing the most recent survey yesterday, um, which is, is very well timed. Um, it's The first main thing is that it's very difficult to untangle the effects of carp and waterfowl. Um, we exclude both at the same time, generally speaking. Uh, it's very difficult in a flowing river set, um, situation where the level comes up and down to keep um, carp in, but the ducks out. Um, but we are slowly getting towards that. And essentially, um, in every case where we have um, excluded both of those things, uh, we have had a positive response in aquatic and emergent and fringing vegetation. So. It's been really good. Um, in some cases, the responses are really strong, and in some cases, they're uh, less strong. And it really depends on uh, the starting state of the spot where you put the exclosure, as well as the depth. Um, so there's a really strong link between the depth of the, the spot where you put the exclosure and, and the things that show up and the abundance of those things. And so, um, I'll be able to share some photos with you if you like, um, and that will be, we're still going there, but it's, it's some of the responses are really, really quite strong after after the first couple of years. It took about two years or so to get some stronger patterns. Awesome. That that sounds about the same with um, what's happened in our carp exclusion in, in Gumbara as well. And now five years in, 
um, they're starting to get a whole new range of um, species that are colonising that they've sort of kicked off on their own little trajectory. But uh, sure. good work. Great, thank you. All right, well, thank you um, again, Chris, for a great presentation. And thanks to everyone for listening in and please follow up uh, with with any further questions or suggestions for collaboration or any other um, reasons at all. Thank you very much and we'll see you again soon. Thanks coming everyone. Thanks, see Get ya. Get in touch if you wanna know more.